Good morning. Welcome to our 9 o'clock worship. Thank you for being here. Members and visitors alike, thank you for being here to worship with us this hour. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't done so, to fill out an attendance card, pass that to any aisle. We'll have some gentlemen come through in just a moment and pick those up. It's chilly outside, but what a beautiful, beautiful day to come together and praise God as a family of believers. Uh, every visitor here is special to us, uh, but we have one with us here I wanted to just uh, embarrass just for a moment. I know her well enough to do this. Uh, for those of you who have a long history here at Washington Street, um, Sister Betty Flo Prosser grew up here at Washington Street uh, in this congregation. Very active family. Her dad was an elder. Uh, her brother was song leader. Um, very, very active family. And 65 years ago, uh, she and Walter Glass were uh, in this auditorium and were married here at Washington Street. Um, he's another good Tennessee boy from Burns, Tennessee. Um, anyway, they moved to California and both became just very, very instrumental in the establishment and development of Pepperdine University, and they've lived in Malibu for many decades. Um, they came home this week, sadly, to bury Walter here in Fayetteville, uh, but the time together has been very special for uh, Betty Flo and all of her friends in the community as well as here in this congregation. And I just wanted those of you who may be sitting, sprinkling around the, sprinkled around the congregation to know that Betty Flo is down front with Janice Carr, another special visitor and uh, lo someone we love here in this congregation. And um, just wanted to make sure uh, that you knew about that. Since there's such a tie to the history of this church, um, very, very, very special family. But again, we welcome all of our all of our visitors. Jeremiah said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And that is where we put our hope. If you'd like to, let's stand for a few songs. Going up all
Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for opportunity to be here today to worship you and to praise your name. Thank you for your weather, Father. Thank you for all our health. Thank you for our safety. Thank you for our nation, Father. We pray for our nation's leaders. Father, we ask you to uh, be with those that can't be here today, those that are sick, those that are ill and, and home, and we pray for those that are grieving and have lost loved ones recently. Um, we give you glory and praise in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Man of sorrow, what a name. This month, we're talking about the different facets of Jesus' existence. And you'll recall last week we talked about Jesus as the creator. Jesus had a role to play in our creation. This week, I'd like to think about Jesus as our brother. And I have three verses I'd like to read. First is Hebrews 12, 2. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And finally, Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. The perspective of last week is Jesus as our creator against this week as Jesus our brother. Those, those seem to be completely opposite. That, that idea of, a, of God becoming as the creation is really antithetical to most religions. They don't, they don't even conceive of that. How could that even be possible? But that is exactly what makes Christianity so amazing. It's the truth that, that the God of creation loved the creation so much that he became one of us. He put on flesh. He changed himself forever. You remember that Jesus was seen uh, for about 40 days after the crucifixion before he was uh, raised into heaven and he had scars on his hands. He ate fish. So whatever our, our existence will be after we die, Jesus has already gone through that. He's been flesh, and he changed himself forever. He will never be like he was in creation. 
and he did that for us. The Romans verse, Romans 8, 16 and 17 that I just read, talks about we are fellow heirs with Christ. And if you think about that, that is, uh, that is a remarkable thought that Jesus, by coming as one of us, has adopted us as brothers and sisters. And the, the inheritance that he deserves is imparted to us, that we can be in the presence of God forever. Jesus is our brother. He chose that. He chose to do that. He, he sacrificed to do that so that we could have the same inheritance as he does. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are so humbled by the love of your son, Jesus. We saw him as our creator, and now we realize, Father, that he is our brother. He chose to give up his place with you and humble himself as a man. Father, we are so thankful for the sinless life that he lived and the sacrifice that he willingly gave for us. Father, we celebrate the fact that he paid for our sins. And as, as sad as that thought might be in one sense, that we caused that to happen, we are overjoyed that he was willing to do that out of his love for us. Father, we gather this morning, and it is a privilege to be together because we know you are in our presence. As we take this bread, Father, let us remember the body, the flesh that Jesus put on as he went to that cross and as he brought us into his family. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray again. Father, again, we are so humbled and thankful to be in your presence this morning and to remember the blood that Jesus himself shed on that cross.
Father, we realize it is that blood that washes us from our sins because only he is a worthy sacrifice. We are so thankful for his love that he was willing to do this for us. And as we take this fruit of the vine, Father, we remember that love and we are thankful to be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, separate and apart from the communion, uh, Father, as we are commanded to give, I pray that it be from a cheerful heart. I pray that these funds will go to furthering your kingdom. Father, I pray over all the elders and deacons and ministers that are in charge of these funds. I pray that you give them wisdom and knowledge uh, to know where to best place these funds, Father. Father, keep, it, keep in mind that... Uh, we are among the most blessed people in the world, Father. Uh, Father, keep us, keep us safe as we go. And Father, in Christ's name we pray, amen.
I'd like to let it stand as we sing. There's a story deep within me, could it be my time has come, when I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done. Is that his voice I am hearing come away, my precious one? Is he called? church. Good morning. There we go. Good to see everybody this morning. Looks like we've got a great crowd this morning. Miss Prosser, I don't know if the, it gets this cold in Malibu, but two days ago it was 69, so welcome to Tennessee. Um, it's good to be together this morning. Good to have all of you. I understand we didn't have a traditional sweetheart banquet this weekend like we normally would, um, but I understand that lots of, lots of good meals went out yesterday to some of our precious owls, our uh, senior members, and uh, saw lots of positive comments. I did not make the cut, so uh, I'm going to take your word for it, uh, that it was uh, a great, great lunch, and just appreciate all those who gathered together yesterday morning in the kitchen and provided those, put, put those lunches together, and those who delivered, I know that Folks were blessed by that. Um, lots, of good, lots of good things that we're able to do and uh, come together. So, uh, You might want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10 this morning is where we're going to start. I think one of the most beautiful pictures of, uh, of Jesus in Scripture comes in John 10. As Jesus draws upon the images of both shepherd and a gate... To, to really emphasize and lay out for us uh, to illustrate just how far His love and His commitment goes to His people. In John chapter 10, I'm going to go down to verse 7. He's talked about being the shepherd, but in verse 7 He says, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Some translations say have it most abundantly. 
that abundant life. I, I love these, uh, the, these metaphors here that Jesus gives us in John 10. And you can back up and begin in verse 1 as he talks about the shepherd. You know, a shepherd is more than just a, a night watchman or a caretaker even. A, a shepherd is absolutely committed to his sheep. That's the image, that's the picture Jesus gives us there. He watches over them. He protects them. He even knows them by name, and they know His voice. He can go out and call them, and they follow. They follow because they know He's not a stranger. And He would even go so far as to lay down His life for His sheep. And and here, uh, picking up in verse 7, the the picture of the gate. The focus is uh, upon the gate, which is is really the, the, the way to the pasture. The way for the sheep to enter into that that pasture where they find sustenance, where they find life. I love that picture. And there in verse 10, the thief comes only to kill and steal and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it most abundantly, to the full. I just think that's so beautiful. It's a passage you know. I come back to this one very often because it's so encouraging to me. And I always love to point out that the word here used in verse 10 for life is is not the word that's often used in the Greek to refer to, you know, just having a pulse, just barely breathing as opposed to being dead. It, it is it is a word, is the Greek word zoe, which carries with it the idea of, of life to the full, life to the max. Uh, It it is that full and vibrant and thriving kind of life that God intends for His people to have. It is is life forever. It is life forever, eternal life as well. And one of the biggest reasons, I guess, I I love this, Jesus would also say in John uh, 8, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Zoe, Jesus is that gate. He is that way. He is that life. So one of the biggest reasons that I, uh, I, I guess I love this because it reminds us that our God is a God of life. He's a God of life. God is the creator of life. Daniel was talking about that from the, uh, during our communion time and last week. He is the creator of life. He is the sustainer of life, the giver of life, the author of of life. And so last month I mentioned to you, um, the 16th I think it was, was uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. And if I'd have been a better planner, I could have, I, I should have coincided what I wanted to do with this lesson with that Sunday. But, but I'd, I wanted to lay some groundwork first. But this morning I want us to circle back to, to the idea of life, Sanctity of Life Sunday. It was a way of many churches getting together and, and emphasizing this idea of, of the value of life, especially as it relates to the unborn. Um, certainly, we think about the, as we think about the culture of the kingdom of God, as we have been doing over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the, the values and beliefs that undergird the, the culture of the kingdom. Uh, th- those things that as Kingdom citizens, we are to live out and exemplify in our own culture. And sometimes that can be quite difficult. Sometimes that can be uh, quite challenging. But certainly as we think about the culture of the kingdom of God, we would recognize that the culture of the kingdom is a culture of life. And especially as it relates to the smallest and the most fragile among us. Last week we talked about the, what, what I think are really the, the two most essential values, the two most essential uh, ethics uh, elements of the kingdom culture, and that is grace and truth. And so this morning I want to lay down some truth, but I also want to do it with the most grace that I can muster, that I know how. And I want to be very careful how, how I, I talk about this and what I say for a couple of reasons. First, it's a very emotional issue as we think about life. It's a very emotional issue. Likely some of you has, have 
wrestled with this on a deeply personal level. Whether you are a survivor of abortion, or maybe you've dealt with it in your family, it could be that you even wrestle with guilt from past mistakes. And I want you to know this morning that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. That there is no mistake God cannot forgive. No, no distant country God cannot bring you back from. And no hurt that He can't bring healing to. And, and so my desire this morning is to speak with both conviction but also with compassion. Grace and in a redemptive way. And secondly, I know abortion is an issue that has greatly divided our country. And it's unfortunate, I think, that it's become such a political issue these days. Because I really think that makes it hard to talk about. That's really tainted the discussion. You guys know me. I don't do politics from the pulpit. Not if I can help it. So don't expect me this morning to... Uh, to tell you who to vote for, which party to support, or what to even think about such things. But, but I do want to talk about life from a moral and a theological point of view. Um, across the world, more than 42 million abortions occur every year. It's an average of 115,000 a day. There are a number of, uh, there are, those are numbers that I, I can't even wrap my head around. Compare that with the Jewish Holocaust. Six million Jews perished during that time. In World War II, some 50 to 56 million died as a direct result of the, of the war over that four-year period. You might compare it, too, to the roughly 5.78 million COVID deaths worldwide since 2020. Over a million of these abortions occur in the United States every year. The largest, wealthiest, most Christian nation in the world, right? And I think there's something wrong with that. These are alarming statistics. Of course, we know abortion is not a new thing. Uh, it is well known from ancient times. In fact, there are ancient writings that mention uh, abortion from Plato to Aristotle. We also know from history that Christians, uh, from the first century on, Christians were well known for being those people who, who rescued children, who, who rescued those especially those who'd been abandoned to die by exposure. And they brought them into their homes and they adopted them. We know from Scripture that mass infanticide was well known, was also practiced. We know during the time of Moses, the oppressive hand of Pharaoh in Moses' time, again in the first century when Jesus was born, uh, it, it is interesting, I think, to note in both of those, on both of those occasions, it was a mass genocide of infants carried out by, powerful by a powerful government ruler in order to thwart the work of God. So this morning, as we think about life, and that's what I want us to focus upon, I want us to see, first of all, life matters to God. And it ought to matter to God's people as well. It matters to God for a lot of reasons. Number one, human beings are created, in the, are created by God, right? Now, now we, we scratch our heads at this. We think, well, this is common sense, preacher. I, I, I hope so. I hope it is. I want to share with you three texts this morning that really give us insight, I think, into how God views life. One comes from Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. These are probably well-known texts to us. But in Psalm 139, picking up in verse 13, the, the psalmist writes this to God. He says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. 
Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, we realize the Psalms that are, are first and foremost poetry. This is poetic language. It's not always uh, in the Psalms, not always to be taken literally or certainly scientifically. But, but what the psalmist gives us here is not a medical journal article, but it get, uh, on, on the development of a, of a, of a fetus in the womb. But, but it gives us a beautiful picture of the idea that, that God creates human beings. God creates life. God creates us intentionally, purposefully, and wonderfully. Uh, the, the picture here, our bodies are like beautiful and complex tapestries that are, that are woven together intentionally. And God has prepared us for a purpose, a purpose for which we are to live out our days. And that purpose is determined uh, or, or laid out for us even before we are born. God knows our purpose how it would change the discussion if we saw every unborn child as a life handcrafted by God for a purpose. Human beings created by God. Human beings are known by God even before they are born. Over in Jeremiah, Mark, you read from Jeremiah a moment ago, but back in chapter 1, in verse 5, the the prophet writes this, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Speaking from God. Before you were born, I set you apart, and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, is not that go along with what Psalm 139 was saying, right? If God knew Jeremiah, and granted, Jeremiah was a, was a great and, and, and mighty spokesperson for God. He... he he was used by God for mighty purposes. But if God knew Jeremiah before he, was, uh, before he was born, if He knew him in the womb, don't you suppose He knows others as well? Scripture speaks about how God calls and names and blesses us while we are still in the womb. Isaiah 49 and verse 1, Before I was born, the Lord called me. And from my birth, he's made mention of my name. Isaiah had that, that, uh, that, that understanding that God had a purpose and a plan for his life from even before the time he was born. Paul, too, in Galatians 1 and verse 15, would speak about being set apart by God at his birth. The idea that, 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 God, know, that, that God knows us even before we were born. Uh, that's, a powerful, that's a powerful truth that we see here in Scripture. Uh, we also see uh, human beings matter to God for a lot of reasons. Human beings are made in the image of God. This is a concept, I come back to this a lot, back in Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. The very account of creation, we get, we get, this, uh, we get this foundation, Right? Down in verse 26 of Genesis 1, God said, After He had created all, uh, uh, all the creation, the sun and the moon, the stars, the animals, at the end of every day, it's good, it's good, it's good. In verse 26, He said, uh, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And He goes on to give mankind a mandate to fill the earth and subdue it. At the end of that sixth day, He looked back and He didn't say it's good. Look at it again. He says it's very good. God creates, God knows, and when God creates, He creates in His own image. Male and female, both made in the image of God. 
And folks, that gives, that gives them value beyond all other human life on the planet. No other creature bears God's image like human beings do. And, and that means so much, much, so, so much more that to be made in the image of God. I, I, it's, it's, this is something theologians have wrestled with. What does that mean? I think it means so much more than that we resemble God. It means we represent God. It means we represent God. An, an image in, uh, in the ancient world was a way of representing rule or dominion. Um, that, that was one of the problems with, with idolatry in the ancient world. An idol or an image represented the so-called God that it was made to, to, to look like, made to represent, right? It, 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 was a way of, it was a way for rulers to communicate and emphasize their rule and domain over, over an area, over a nation. An image would be set up that told all the people who's in charge. That's what an image, that's what an idol did. And the reason God's people weren't to make images representing Yahweh, God, was because they were already the images. Human beings were already the images created and meant to represent Yahweh to the world, meant, meant to, to, to represent His reign and domain. Dominion over all the world. Made to, uh, they were image bearers. We were placed here. Human beings were placed here to testify to the world who's in charge. It's not us. It's God. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. So human life matters because it matters to God. It matters to God for, for these and, and a lot of other reasons. And I know people will say that the issue of abortion is a complicated and a complex one. And I, I agree with that. I know that it is. I know that there are a great many complexities which surround why a woman might seek an abortion. There are, there are health reasons. There are societal pressures to be sure. There are a good number of economic factors. Why is it that uh, abortion is uh, more predominant in, uh, uh, in, in poorer regions of the world, in poorer areas of our country? It affects, it affects us disproportionately in society. There are certainly economic financial factors. There are a myriad of factors which have contributed to the, the problem of abortion, and, and they're not likely to be solved overnight. Uh, they're not going to be solved if Roe versus Wade is, is overturned. And I know that there's discussion, a lot of hope, and a lot of discussion on that. Right now, we know that abortion is legal in this country, even funded in large part by our federal government. There are many of us who would like for that to change but the reality is, and this is one of the complexities, that even if abortion were made illegal, it wouldn't stop them. It wouldn't stop them. It would, it would make them more unsafe. It would make them more dangerous to the women who would seek them. I understand that. And on top of that, if, if they were to stop today, that would mean 115,000 children all over the world every day would come into this world and wanted, needing a home needing a family. I understand that. There are complicated factors. My heart goes out to women who for whatever reason don't feel as if they have a choice other than to seek an abortion. These are complicated problems, many of them, but, but are any of them justification for taking of life created by God known by God, made in God's image? It seems to me the question is not, does, does a woman have the right to choose, but does a child have a right to live? Abortion, it seems to me, takes away that right from, from the one who isn't even able to make that choice for themselves. 
What can Christians do about it? I, I don't have all of the answers. I, I don't have all of the answers. I, we promote life. We can do that. We advocate for the unborn who, who cannot advocate for themselves. Uh, we, we find ways to come alongside women who are considering an abortion and we minister to them and we, we love them with the love of Christ. It's, what, it's why I love, I mentioned last month, the, the work down the road at the Crossroads Crisis Pregnancy Center. I, I, I love the work that they do. That's what, that's what they seek to do is to love folks with the love of Jesus so that folks know they have another choice. And I would suggest way, I would suggest that we might even that, that we begin to address some of the complexities that I mentioned. How can we as Christians work to alleviate the financial and the socioeconomic factors that play into it? How, how can we work to provide alternatives? How can Christians promote adoption as an option? Taking in children ourselves. I know, I know of several friends who have, who have made this a priority in their families. The taking in of children. The blessing them with a Christian home. I mean, you talk about making disciples. What, what more powerful thing could we do than, than to, in the life of a child show them Christ? I would encourage us to look for ways, be on the lookout for such opportunities. But also this morning, I, I, want, us, I want us to think about life. If, if life matters to God, and it, then it should matter to God's people. We know this. That also means that all life matters to God. Right? And all life should matter to God's people. In other words, if we're gonna if we're gonna be pro life, we need to be pro all life. Because doesn't all human life matter to God? In order for our, our ethic of life to be consistent, we need to value not only the unborn life, certainly, but also the life, those who are different from us those who are typically outcast, those we might even deem to be undeserving. It seems to me that Jesus spent an awful lot of time with these people. As you read through the Gospels, right, you you constantly find Jesus spending time with those folks that the world has thrown away. Those folks that the world has disregarded. For example, in Luke chapter 5, a man with leprosy came to Jesus asking for healing. Jesus reached out His hand, and before He healed the man, you remember what He did? He touched him. He touched him with His own hands. Who touches a leper? In Mark chapter 14, Jesus went into the home of a man who was known to be a leper, and He ate with him. Who does that? Even if if He had been healed by Jesus, who does that? In John chapter 5, Jesus encountered a man who had laid at the city gate for almost 40 years, uh, unable to, to make it to, to, to get into the pool nearby, which offered some hope of, of, of healing. He wasn't even able to do that. And apparently it doesn't seem like anybody was willing to help him. But instead of walking by, trying not to make eye contact like most everybody else was probably doing, Jesus stopped and initiated a conversation with him. What do you want? Started a conversation with him. Who does that? In John chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. Now just think about what it would have been like to have been blind from birth in that culture the burden that you would be on your family. And Jesus treats that man with respect and compassion and dignity. Over and over in Scripture, we find Jesus right in the middle, always, of ministering to people who the world had thrown away, the world had discarded. In Matthew 25, Jesus told a parable. I don't have it on the screen. In Matthew 25, Jesus told a parable 
very familiar to us, but a king, right, who came to reckon with his servants. And down in verse 34, when the king came, came back, the king said to those, he separated those, uh, he separated those, the, the sheep from the goats, those on his left and his right, and he said, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we, when did we do this? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you homeless? When did we see you a stranger? When did we see you naked? When did we see you sick? And the king replied, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Jesus here is emphasizing to His disciples as He emphasizes to us that the work of the kingdom of God is more than just protecting those innocent among us, but it is about serving all human life, especially those the world has discarded. Because when we do so, in the name of Jesus, we are serving Him. It's as if we are serving Him. I want to point you back to the statement that I read at the beginning of, of the series just a couple of weeks ago, because I think it, uh, it again brings home to us the kind of kingdom that Jesus seeks. It says Jesus is building an upside-down kingdom, uh, unlike the kingdoms of the world, Right? The kingdoms of the world throw away people that don't matter, that aren't viable, that don't have the ability to care for themselves. But an upside-down kingdom cares for these people. Where outcasts have their feet washed, the marginalized are welcomed, and dehumanized people are made to feel human once again. The truth is upheld, celebrated, and proclaimed, and where those who fall short of that truth as we all do, are loved, and where all are called to surrender to the reign of God. Church, I know that we love babies. Some of us would lay down our lives to protect the unborn. I hope we'll always be a people who love and protect and fight for the unborn. But, but what about the stranger? What about the, the alien, the immigrant? What about the outcast? What about the homeless? What about those who've been dehumanized and devalued by the culture of the world? Do do they see God's people coming to their aid and advocating for them, ministering to their needs and protecting their lives and their interests? Church, either we, we value and sanctify life, all human life, or we don't. And I'm proud to be a part of a group of people who values all life no matter what value the world places on it. We want to offer a word of prayer this morning for you if you have a need. If there is something in your life we can encourage you about, if we can wrap our arms around you and pray for you, we would love that opportunity. This morning, if you are ready to surrender to the reign of God in your life, we would love to assist you in the waters of baptism this morning. We would like no better No better thing. How can we encourage you? How can we pray for you this morning? Won't you come while together we stand and together we sing? Live for Jesus, oh my brother, is desire.
looks like we have several on the prayer list. Uh, Martha Parks, who is in room 229 in the Leakton Medical Center. Charlene Richardson, she's doing better and has returned to home. John Walsh, father of Terry Smith, has been diagnosed with bladder cancer. Jim White, senior of RCA, a student, lost his mother in an auto accident several days ago. I kind of want to think about him especially. I know he lost his grandparents earlier, what, six, eight months ago before that, so I know he's having a rough time there. We express our sympathy to the family of Jim Lancaster, Father Lucy Cooley. Funeral service as held on Tuesday, February 8th in Lebanon. We express our sympathy to the family of Mike Mason, Father of Lori Lawrence. Graveside service was held on Saturday at the Rose Hill Cent Memorial Gardens in Tullahoma. If you would, bow with me as we close out. It's good to see everybody. Dear God, our Father in heaven, as we approach you, may we approach you as humbly as we know how. Always acknowledge you as a great creator, creator of life, as we've studied and heard about today. We pray that this service we had today was acceptable and pleasing to you. And may we live our daily lives as sacrifice to you. And as we think about you as the great creator of life, all life, may we think about that life, but also remember as we go through our daily lives, the souls that each one of us has been given as we reach out to other people, that the soul lives forever. Help us to do the great command to go out and spread your word to use our talents, the purpose that you have given each one of us, how great or small, to serve you to the best capacity that we have. Know that you're always there with us, that you've given us the Holy Spirit to help us along. We thank you for that. We thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. Help us always remember the value of life, especially focus on our own lives. That you know that each one of our days are numbered, and it's not up to us to take Decide on when that time has come, but when that time comes, you'll bring us home. We thank you for your son who is willing to die on the cross for us, that we do to have that hope to be with you in heaven someday. As we think about that, we think about the body that meets here at Washington Street and the many members here that we all work together in unity and love. Again, help us to go out each day of our life to be good servants of yours. And in Christ's name, Amen.